Hello everybody and welcome to another Chrissy B Show special. Today we'll be continuing our series of real life stories. Previously we revisited stories of depression, bullying and self-harm and today we want to look back at some stories that involve dealing with some sort of personal disadvantage. What caught my attention about the people that we've chosen to feature in this show is that they didn't let this disadvantage define them. First up, we have the story of one of my closest friends and motivational speaker, Moti Bernardino, the daughter of anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, Steve Biko. Moti talked about what it was like growing up in the apartheid system and how those memories and experiences still affected her later on in life, but also how she changed things around. Also, we recall Tommy Rose's story, a young boy who made £1 million on eBay and how he started his booming businesses at secondary school. And finally, we'll check out the time when I met professional English football player Leon Legg, who at 16 discovered that he had epilepsy, but that certainly did not stop him from following his dreams. So make sure you stay tuned to hear his story later on. But first up, it's the story of Moti Bernardino, a motivational speaker and daughter of anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, Steve Biko. Check it out. Now it's time to say hello to my lovely friend, very close friend, Moti Bernardino, Hi, who you've Chris. seen several times before because she's, she's one of my closest friends and you've seen her on a few videos and things, haven't we? Yep, and it's good to be back. <laughs> Always good to be on the show. <laughs> so Moti, we're going to speak about something that's uh, very serious, but I'd like to talk about the, the root of why you really didn't love yourself for, for a number of years. Now, mm -hmm. first of all, you are the daughter of the legendary Steve Biko. That's can, right. Can you tell the viewers who he is in case yeah. they don't know? My dad was Steve Biko. He was an anti-apartheid activist. Mm -hmm. And so he founded a movement called the Black Consciousness Movement. And what the movement did was challenge the apartheid system, apartheid system at the time mm -hmm. and empower black people so that they could believe that they were just as good as any other race and actually um, got them to in a non-violent way, challenge the system and, okay. and yeah. Which is, now, the, a film was made about him as well, and his yeah. part was played by Denzel Washington. How does that feel having your dad? I brag all the time, <laughs> like, yeah, who has Denzel Washington play your father on film? <laughs> yeah, I got to, I was privileged enough to have that experience. It was actually wonderful for me because um, he, he died when I was four months, so I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about him at all. I grew up without him. I missed, I missed growing up with him. So having to watch the film uh, helped me to sort of understand the work that he did, the struggles that he mm -hmm. went through to find, to found his, um, to start his movement and, and why he's so dearly loved by so many people. Okay. Yeah. Now, now what, what kind of things did you go through in South Africa? Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up while apartheid was still legal. So, mm -hmm. um, do you have many memories of, of when it was I all do. separated? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, it's, it, it happened in my in my early childhood, mm -hmm. but it was so strong. It was so strong that it kind of got stuck to to my memory. It's not something mm -hmm. that you know was far was not far. It wasn't far removed from mm -hmm. from me. Um, Luckily, I, I, I mean, it, I caught it towards the end, so I got to see the transition. I got okay. to experience the yeah. transition, but I, I did get up. I, I did get a bit of, um, yeah, the, the, the struggles that black Can you people describe faced. some of the things that, that you saw. I mean, ra racial slurs, I, just being segregated and having an area that's completely white uh, dominated, an area that's black, and being told that, you know, this is the area that you belong to, this is where you're going to stay, this is where you're going to live. We didn't have the liberty to live wherever we wanted to live. Mm -hmm. Even if we could afford better places, we were kind of like very segregated. And the, area, the, the areas that black people got to live in were very poorly, were, you know, they were not very structured. Mm -hmm. The schooling system was very poor so I, I sort of um, the first in, in high school no, not high school but uh, primary school I went to a, sc a school that was predominantly black and it, the education level did not compare right. so everything about the apartheid system was meant to make black people inferior so they were given inferior um, education so that they wouldn't be able to compete in, in jobs and in university with with other races yeah mm -hmm. so it, it was unfortunate very now you said you, you obviously witnessed the, the way everything changed. So yeah. did you then go to a mixed school after that? I did. Um, it was actually the, the government, 
I think when I started, the government was still apartheid um, governed, but um, my school was private. It was a private school, so it was a non-governmental okay. school. So they could pretty much do it or accept anyone that they wanted into the school. And um, my group was the first of um, the first black uh, black children that were accepted into the school. Really? So we were kind of like an experiment. I think oh, the gosh. country was transitioning and people could tell that, you know, apartheid was going to end. Um, talks were being, were, there were talks going on of um, Mandela coming out of prison. So the mentality was starting to shift a little bit. And so that's my school, which was a German school. It was a German school, mm -hmm. it was private, um, uh, open spaces to black children to be able to come. So- Do you remember the first day? I do. How, what was that like when people staring at you? Is it... It, it, you, you just, you've just said it. It was people staring. So I kind of <laughs> felt like <laughs> I'm walking into, I kind of felt like an animal in a zoo actually. Oh. Like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Everybody, I mean, you walk in, the message, although it was not said, but the message yeah. was, who are these people and where did they come from? Oh I, literally, the How stairs. How were you feeling? I was, I, I, you know, I was raised to be very confident as a kid, so I was very confident, but at the same time, you, I mean, you can tell that, you know, this is not natural. This mm. is not natural, I, I, I'm not fitting in. And I, I, I'm very good at making small talk and getting to know people. But it, there was just a barrier that was really, really hard to break. And, and it kind of felt like an interview, actually. I remember we had, I mean, uh, kids coming to us, asking all these questions. So who are you? Why are you coming into our school? Well, well you know, all these questions thrown, thrown at us. And it was hard because there was like a, a, a unit that had already formed. Everybody yeah, knew yeah. that the, the, the thing about our school was that um, it, it was a school that started from kindergarten and went all the way to high school. So everybody that was in high school knew each other oh, okay. from kindergarten. Yeah, yeah. So we were just joining them while they were at high school level, but they had known each other their whole lives. There. Did, and did you get treated badly, Moti? I did. I did um, verbally um, yeah, horrible things being said, you know, um, like I said, I, I, I mean, I was brought up to believe in myself and to believe that, you know, um, you can do it, you're well, uh, you, 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 you're an intelligent girl. So to be, to be brought up that way and come into the school and all of a sudden be looked at as an outcast, be looked, I mean, even be called names like, oh, you black monkey or, you know, mm. hor hor horrible names and you have your parents, um, insulted by people oh, you're, you 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 you're not good for anything you're not worth anything oh you're just gonna be uh, you, you you're gonna get this education and you're actually gonna waste it because all you're good at all you're worth you're worthy of is to work in someone's house and be a cleaner so you you're just taking wow. space from from people who can actually use this education because what are you gonna do with it you're gonna be a maid in someone's house oh my god so that yeah. did not that message did not um did not match the message that i was getting at home which was i mean even from 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 my dad's example and my dad's literature, which was believe in yourself. So that for me felt abusive because it was very it was, different. It was, definitely. It was different from what I was hearing. And it stood out. It stood out um, horribly for me because it was the first time that I had heard such a negative message directed at myself. Mm -hmm. So um, to be told that I was not going to be worth, I wasn't worth anything. And you know, it, and, and to come into a school, you know, I, um, not have people to play with, um, when, when the school, school dances, tell me, which girl does not like to be asked to the school dance? <laughs> when they're Valentine's Day, it's like nobody likes to date you, nobody wants to send you. So it just was a horrible message. It just made me feel like I'm really not good enough. Well, don't go away because after the break, we'll be showing you part two of Motti's story and how apartheid affected her later on in life. So I'll see you in just a second. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky 203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show.
Welcome back and if you've just joined us, today's show is all about revisiting people who have had some kind of disadvantage in their life and how they didn't let that disadvantage define them. And just before the break, we saw again the story of Motte Bernardino, a TV presenter, motivational speaker and daughter of anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, Steve Biko. So let's take a look now at the second part of her story. Now, you, you grew up, you moved to the UK, you know, living, you got married, living yeah. a happy life. Yeah. But then one day you realised that actually some of that was still in you and yeah. you weren't, you didn't love yourself like you thought you did. Can you yeah, tell us actually, about that? Yeah, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I, I wasn't expecting it because I had completely thought, you know what, I'm, st I'm strong. I, I, this is how I would describe myself. I'm strong. What happened didn't affect me. It wasn't my fault. I, I, I so I, I was comfortable with what happened because I'm kind of like I, I'm clear on who I am. That's what mm. I thought. But then one day, I was um, one day something happened, which was unfortunate, but it it brought about um, an understanding that later on helped me. Because I, I was with a bunch of friends and and we were having a pretty good time, you know, um, relaxed. It was uh, meant to be a happy time, and one of them said something to me. That, um, I, I mean, I can't, I, I honestly can't remember the details of what they said, but I know that I felt like what she said was an injustice. Like you shouldn't have said that. That's not right. And I became so angry at her and I, I, I kind of like, you know, v very intimidating in how I handled the situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, a situation that could have just, you know, been squashed and handled pretty much easily. I, I, I was very intimidating towards her and she like popped her eyes out like this. And I, I remember seeing my friends scared, kind of like, uh oh, what's she going to do? Mm -hmm. And um, and that made me realize about my temper and it made me realize that, you know what, um, as much as I believe that I'm strong, I could identify after taking some time and really thinking about it, I could identify a lot of um, behaviors that I had that were negative mm. that came on because of that, because I hadn't really dealt with what had happened at school. I had just, you know, swapped it under the rug, forgotten it, but I really hadn't um, confronted it. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I haven't, hadn't forgotten it, definitely not. And I hadn't confronted it and dealt with it. I just left it, like kind of left it untouched, left it to the side, moved on. And it affected See, it's me. very important what you're saying, Mota, because sometimes there's certain uh, ways that we might behave mm -hmm. and react to things. And, and even mm -hmm. like people around us are like, what is her problem? Yeah. What's going on? Why is she reacting that way? And even ourselves, you might think, oh my God, why, why did I just react that way? Yeah. You should ask that question. Don't just kind of like, just sweep it under the carpet and think, oh, it's just one of those things I was having a bad day. Because if you're starting to see a pattern, there's something behind that behavior. You can't just assume it's nothing because you don't, just react to certain ways in, in certain ways because, because for nothing there's yeah. some, there's a root behind that yeah. as you discovered there was yeah and uh, not only with my temper but um kind of like a need for approval all the time it was you know i i i, I could never say no to anyone because i was i was always doing the same thing that i was doing at high school trying to gain someone's approval kind of like hello notice me i'm not this bad person so um you know i i i, I i'm really love me Can you love me please i was like um still seeking not even the approval of my peers but really the approval of of the kids back at high school in, yeah. in in anything that i did so it was still affecting me i was very dependent on other people accepting me to feel good about myself which i i i had not realized i had not wow. realized that about myself yeah how did you turn it around then Moti? um you know it kind of some uh, um a reflection that um made me made me, it was it was um how do you say um a turnaround moment i was talking mm -hmm. to someone and when i was talking to that person i was listening to her talk about herself right and i was thinking oh gosh she's so negative about how she talks about herself at that point mm -hmm. had not even internalized anything and she was saying and i i know I, I stopped and i said but look you're saying all these things about you. Would you say, would you, for example, you would never come to a friend and say, oh, look, you're so horrible. Like, you, you're very stupid. You'd never say that to your mm -hmm. friend. You're so, you're, you're, you're so, um, 
you like you you um i don't know you you you're worth nothing you're worthless you don't say these things to to your friends why do you say them to yourself mm. and now as i was talking to her kind of like a film in my mind played about every single thing that i do that i tell myself that i say that i say about myself you know how i see myself everything played played up in me and i realized wow you know i take care of so many relationships i take care of the relationship between me and my husband i take care of the relationships between my friends so much so that some of these answers were coming because i was seeking to not intimidate my friends i was seeking because uh, to to have a better relationship with my friends so i do so much but the most important relationship in my in my in my life which is my relationship with myself i don't really take care of and that's where everything begins that's a very powerful statement mm -hmm. because i think that is oh that is the most important relationship that you yeah. have isn't it with yeah. yourself because like you said you can be looking after all other relationships in your life yeah. and think you're doing okay but you can still be miserable because yeah. the one with yourself isn't good that's exactly. really powerful and in that relationship for example i mean you're going to be with yourself for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> you can't escape from it you can escape from your husband for five minutes even a second <laughs> from friends you can escape but you can't escape from yourself so that needs to be a very strong relationship because then mm -hmm. it starts to affect the relationships of others and once i defined that that about me that's where my inner healing started okay. yeah, it didn't happen immediately but that's where it started because then mm -hmm. i started fixing these things with the with, uh, fixing my own relationship with myself yeah. it started with how i talk to myself like i i demand from myself that i the same respect that i would have for you I demand that I have for myself Good. the same, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, the same way that I would encourage you when you start a new project, like, uh, come on, Chris, you can do it. I demand that I do that for myself as well. So everything that I am ready to do for others, I'm also ready to do for myself. That's excellent. And, and it's been great. Yeah. Now, Motta, you've actually followed in your father's footsteps in the sense <laughs> of now you're a motivational speaker yeah. and you're involved in some weekly seminars that actually help women yeah. to get that inner healing because this is a, this is a type of healing that, that you went through. Yeah. Can you tell us about those seminars? Yeah. You know, um, these seminars began mainly because um, we, rea we realised that women are, uh, you know, women are warriors. Women are always, you know, um, working hard, dealing with a lot of things, but very rarely do we take time to take care of ourselves. I mean, at work, we're working hard to prove ourselves because, you know, we ha you have to do twice as well in order to gain the, re the recognition of your peers. You're, a woman, when she goes through a divorce, she has no time to deal with how that divorce affects her if she has children because she's taking care, she's thinking of her children, making mm -hmm. it, you know, uh, that, that, that situation lighter for her kids. So she's always thinking, uh, women are always thinking about other people. I think we're natural carers. And yeah. the reason we started these meetings exclusively for women was that you know um, first of all with this realization that we as women need to do better with the relationship with ourselves we need to take time to fix this relationship because it's everything hinges on it so we we need mm -hmm. to be strong within ourselves we, we, we tend to put push things aside when a partner cheats on you we tend to put push that aside you know someone hurt you you push it aside because you you've got to push on you've got to to move forward there's no time to deal with it so we're kind of forcing our, uh, ourselves the members who attend our, our meetings to take that time to 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 work on themselves mm -hmm. and to heal inside yeah and you're seeing great results aren't you already yeah, yeah. we're seeing i mean w wonderful results people you know people uh, kind of the same way that i had done doing um coming coming to realizations about actions that are um, that they're taking things that they're doing lately that started way back we, you you get someone we get people saying oh my god i remember my mom because I, I remember one uh, there was a there was one of one of our group members saying talking about a relationship that she had with her mom that you know um, and she realized that it all started in her in her childhood in so she had been a rebellious teenager and she couldn't understand why and because she started doing this work on herself as well she realized 
realized that it actually began from something small that her mom did. She cried out for help during the night because she was having an asthmatic attack and her mom uh, didn't show up. Her mom said to her dad, you go, you go and, 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 and take care of your child because I can't go there. And because she heard her mom refuse to come and help her at that, at that time when she was desperately in need mm -hmm. of help, she, 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 saw, she, she heard her refuse and so it affected her, her so entire that, relationship. There's a root to and, and yeah, there yeah. was a root, and she's completely healed wow. because of these meetings. Yeah, Brilliant. she's That's excellent. moved on. And what was great about Motti's story is that she did realize there was an issue. She realized that she had roots from her past. And as soon as she did, she did something about it. So even though um, I would say her background was very difficult and she grew up with a lot of insecurity, she didn't, um, she didn't accept to stay that way. She looked for help and now she's actually been able to inspire others, which I think it's, you know, it's really, really great. Now, if you have a story to share to help inspire other people, don't forget you can get in touch with us, chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow and also comment on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. After this quick break, we move on to our next story about a young boy who grew up on an estate, but who made one million pounds on eBay. Only here on The Chrissy B Show. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky 203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back everybody to today's program and we are revisiting people who had some kind of disadvantage in their life and how they didn't let that disadvantage define them. So before the break we've already seen Motti Bernardino's story who's a TV presenter, motivational speaker and daughter of anti-apartheid activist in South Africa Steve Biko and thankfully she's ended up helping and inspiring people just like her famous father did. And now we look back at young boy Tommy Rose's successful entrepreneurial story. Watch this. Hello Tommy. Hello. <laughs> how are you? I'm doing good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. It's great to have you on the show because you've got quite a story to tell and I'm sure everyone knows you already because you hit the headlines all over the place for selling sweets at your school. Getting into a bit of trouble but also you know, being very successful from it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've always been into business ever since when I was eight. Eight? Yeah. Really? Match attack cards was big. Uh -huh. So I had the whole collection and doubles. So I'd go in the school playground, primary school, and I'd knock them out, say, three for 70p, three oh, for 50p. That'd Did be... you learn that from anyone, or was it just you? Well, we'd, we'd do swaps, a bit like, where you compare them to each other, and mm -hmm. if the ease was better than mine, he'd get to keep my cards, and then, they said, bring them in school, Tom, flog them mm -hmm. to us. So that's exactly what I did, and I was only getting £1.70 a day, but that was enough for ice cream and a yeah. can of Coke. Would well, you say that kind of gave you the thirst to do more, even from that Yeah, and then, and then when I left primary school, I obviously went into high school and I noticed it was a healthy eating school and everybody wanted crisp, <laughs> chocolate, Lucasades. <laughs> so I thought, I I'll do this. And with me being in year seven, I obviously got caught straight away just being immature, messing around with friends. Mm -hmm. And then I let it all cool down and then just, just con concentrated on my work. Yeah. And then I was just I was just at home one day, and my mum and dad were just talking about that university that no one's ever graduated in in the family. And I thought, yeah, I want to go to university now. And about a week later, I just had an adult chat with them and just said, how could I get this money to go to university? And they said we'd give our right arm to senior, uh -huh. but you have got two other sisters, so the money's got to be split equally. Okay. So I just said if I sold in school and put the money into a savings account, mm -hmm. let it go on from there. And then they would have thought I would have got caught in the first week like I did, but I had my mind focused on my goals. And now I've got £14,000. And I, there's a few businessmen that um, are giving me 
the the right amount of money for the free terms at university, so that's good. Okay, so you make, you you started off selling the stuff at, at school. Yeah. You actually had a couple of employees as well, didn't you? Yeah, I employed uh, <laughs> two two friends. who was mm -hmm. loyal. They would they wouldn't do nothing bad, like eat the products or anything. You could trust them, so that was the main thing. Paying them twenty. So you could you could already spot like a good employee. Yeah, you? They, they wouldn't they eat was, the sweets. They wouldn't eat the chocolate. Yeah, they, 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 were, they weren't greedy. They was getting five pound fifteen a day, and they thought. That, that's that's enough because they, they, they didn't have much neither. So okay. to get 20, £27.50 at the end of the week and save it up, then that, that that's a lot a month. Mm -hmm. So I employed them to, now I've gone into doing my T-shirts. Uh, before we get to that, because yeah. I want to hear a bit more about stuff at school. Now, what kind of kept you motivated to keep doing what you were doing at school? Did you constantly have like the uni stuff in your head all the time? Yeah, Would well, you say, it, or was it, it just the sort of excitement of making money? It was a bit of both, to be honest. Like, yeah. I did love to make the money, but everyone thought the money was just going to go into my back pocket, but it was going into a child's trust fund for university. Yeah. I just thought, I just want to go to university to better myself in every way. Yeah. So I thought, I, I don't want a student loan because I have an aunt there, she's around 33 now, and she's still paying us back. Yeah. Off, so I so thought, you did the debt yeah, thing. so, so I, did, I didn't want the debt thing, so okay. that's why that's that's why I did it. That's really good. Gosh, okay then. So then then you moved on from there. You also put your Lucas A bottle on eBay, which, yeah. which everybody heard about, and the bid was what in the end? Um, around one million. Okay. But <laughs> was that it, shocking for you? That 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 was madness. Like the the evening news got involved around my area mm. and put put it on, and then it went it went to a million pound, but. Um, through PayPal, I had a £50,000 deposit mm -hmm. on it, and then the rest, with it being such a large amount, eBay legals have got to handle it now. OK, well, you're going to get it, hopefully, won't you? Hopefully. <laughs> I've already right. had 50000 so yeah, that's good. OK, that's, but... that's really good. Now, now, I know you've got your T-shirt business, but I'd just like to ask you something first. Regarding sort of other youngsters in your area at school and stuff. It must have been maybe quite tempting when you see other kids sort of messing around or getting into trouble and stuff like that and peer pressure. How did you kind of separate yourself from that and just get on with doing what you had to do? Well, they do the same stuff every day and I've already done that stuff before. Mm -hmm. and I thought, I don't need to get involved. I need to stay under the radar to get this money. So I just have to remove, maybe still have them as friends, but maybe mix, mix with other people that aren't mm -hmm. getting in trouble. Like, so they're going out in the playground to mess around. I just, I just stay and just keep out of trouble, keep under the radar from the teachers because I didn't want my business then to go downhill through yeah. me messing around okay. and getting kicked out of school or getting, getting put in seclusion or anything like that. So okay, all right. So then you didn't stop there, did you? Because then you had another idea. So how did you come up with the idea for your your t-shirt business? What happened? Well, I was in a lesson one day and we was making t-shirts and I thought, well, that's easy. So I thought, I want to do t-shirts now. I just needed a name. Mm -hmm. When the head teacher accused me of selling black market products, and then I thought that that is the name. That's what I need to do. So then um, a company gave me two thousand t-shirts for free. Oh wow! Okay. So that that was good as well. Mm -hmm. And now I sold them and made around ten thousand pounds. You made ten grand already. Yeah, ten grand already. Wow. And how are you expanding the business now? What are your plans to do that? Well, I'm planning to go into. There's a huge demand for. Jumpers, mm -hmm. like hoodies. So I'm going to do hoodies, gym wear, shorts, vests. I'm just going to go into it all because I'm young and I know what everybody likes. I'm into fashion myself. So mm -hmm. if I can add like a bit of twist to it and give them something that they all want, then that'll be mm -hmm. good too. Now you've attracted attention as well, haven't you, Tommy? Because you also done something with one of Dragon's Den's finest. Yeah, <laughs> the Feet the is well. Well, that was madness right from the start. I was shocked when he left. Like two hours later, I was still shocked, thinking, "Wow, that's just happened." It was, it was madness. Mm -hmm. He gave me some very good tips, and it was mad for him, like to basically chew, chew to me and tell me, you, "You need to focus on your business, or you need to focus on your grades. You either want to go to university, or you need to focus on your business." He said, "I should focus on my business because I'm already doing it now and I'm being successful." Yeah, exactly. So, are you going to follow his advice? I think so, yeah, because yeah. he's worth, two, he started from nothing, he, he run a tuck shop in his school yeah, and then he was yeah. a tea boy at 18, so he, he started from nothing, I'll look at him now, mm. so I think he said, um, just to, just try and follow in his footsteps yeah. and try and be successful, Definitely. but he sent some really good tweets out. <laughs> yeah, 
That's really good. And it wasn't just him, Deborah Meaden as well, didn't she? Yeah, and, well, yeah. Um, Deborah Meaden did a, a live video tape to me and she said, you're an entrepreneur in the making. No, you're an entrepreneur. Maybe one day I'll be in. And I thought that was really nice for yeah. her to say that. Now, Tommy, um, there's a lot of young people, especially, that say, you know what, I've got no choice but to be on the streets and messing around and getting into trouble because I'm bored and there's nothing to do and I live on a council estate and there's no opportunities for me. What would you say to them? Well, there's no opportunities for them because they're not trying hard enough. They just like to sit on the backside, have a few mates like that. They go, wow, you've done good for yourself now, Tommy. I'd like to be like you, but they could be like me. It's just... They have to have confidence and they have to be passionate. Mm -hmm. So, say, they, they could get into T-shirts. I'd happily empl employ some of them, but it's just a, some of them are lazy. And there's either mm -hmm. two paths you can go down, you can go down messing around, either getting put in jail, Youth Offenders Institute, yeah. or you can be successful, run your own business or work. Mm -hmm. So, I, people just giving up at an early age thinking, oh, I can't be bothered, I'd rather go out with my mates, but you've got to, you've got to push your mates aside, and like I've done, and, and yeah. focus. Okay, and then also I know there's a lot of adults watching as well that maybe have their own business and maybe not going so well. Could you give us, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner now, could you give maybe your top tips on how to have a, a, good, a great business? <laughs> I know you're still in the making and everything, but yeah. what's working for you at the moment that you well, could Well, social pass on media. To yeah. Everyone has social media, so I set it up through PayPal, eBay mm -hmm. shop, what my dad runs for me because I'm not old enough, but yeah. everybody has social media, so I'm taking most of my orders in from social media, so if they put their products on, say, Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, Twitter, Twitter's the main one because there's a lot, a lot of people, all you need to do then is get somebody like to share, like Jason Manford shared mine, tweeted all the dragons, now yeah. I've, gone, I've gone pretty big now. And what are your future plans, Tommy? Because I, I can't see you stopping here now. I can see you kind of. Well, I, I'm keep definitely, going. yeah, I'm definitely not going to stop. What, what I aim to do is I aim to try and conquer the UK and then go to America. Brilliant. Yeah. That's excellent. It's so inspirational. And, and you actually are talking to youngsters now, aren't you? Doing workshops and things? Yeah, well, some of my friends go to the youth clubs so far. Mm -hmm. If I go around to the youth clubs and try and persuade them not to stop that, that there is a light at the end of the dark tunnel, like yeah. not to go down the crime road because th th there's no need for that path. If, you, if, if they all just focused and say, put time into it, a lot of them get excluded from school and they'd mm -hmm. like to be on the street doing other stuff. But the, I, I, I actually don't get it. I've, do, I've done stuff, but you, it's either two paths you go down, like I said, the mm -hmm. jail one or the successful one or work. Yeah. And, and then there's people getting girls pregnant and then they can't provide for them. So mm -hmm. they, I think they should work, really. What keeps you grounded, Tommy? Not to kind of, for it all to get to your head, what keeps you kind of, well, you? Well, just to, just to be myself. Like, I'm still the same lad on, on, on the estate, still the same mm -hmm. lad in the gym, still the same lad at, at home. Just, I just don't let it all get to me. It's great that all the, all, all the stars, Deborah mm -hmm. Meaden, Lord Sugar, Duncan Ballantyne, Fiopa Fetis, Jason Manford, they, they've all supported me and loads of other businessmen. That's yeah. great, but I just, don't, I just don't let it sink into me. I don't want to, be, I don't want to change who I am. Yeah. I like to Definitely. be who I am, so. So as you can see, Tommy didn't um, let his past define him. So a lot of people might say, well, you know what, I'm grown up, I've grown up on an estate. I'm already disadvantaged, I didn't get a great education, people around me, my friends, don't really want to do anything with their life, so I'm going to do the same. He was different, he did something different, and he didn't let where he grew up or his friends or anything else define him. He made his own way and he's doing really, really well, and I'm really happy for him. Well, don't go away because after the break, we'll share with you our final inspirational story of when I met professional English footballer Leon Legg who at 16 years old discovered he had epilepsy, but that didn't stop him from following his dreams. To find out what happened to him, stay tuned. I'll see you in just a second. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky 203. 
Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back. Now on today's show, we're revisiting people who had some kind of disadvantage in their life and how they didn't let that disadvantage define them. And for our final story for you tonight, we take a look back at the time when I met professional English footballer Leon Legg. Let's watch this. Okay, so we have another success story here with me right now, and that's Leon Legg. Hello, Leon. How are you doing? You right? I'm well. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got quite a bit to get through, because um, you're not just going to talk to us about football, but also something else very important. But let's start off with the, with the football, first of all. So you play for Gillingham FC. Yep. How's yeah. that going? <laughs> um, yeah, we just finished the season. Um, it was a tough season. We just got promoted to um, uh, League One. We had uh, a good season. To be fair, we finished around about 14th Brilliant. place. And okay. Yes, it's, 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 going it's well. been a good. Yeah, it's been a good season. Yeah. All right. So, have you always known you wanted to be a footballer since you were young, or did you have other dreams for yourself? I've always wanted to be a footballer. Um, ever since I was nine years old, really. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, I was always, you know, always kicking a ball. When I got in from from um, from from school, yeah, I'd go out and play with my mates. Um, I played football at school. It was. No matter where you saw me, I'd always had a football man. So. Yeah. Okay, and were your family supportive, or were they like, mm, maybe you should do something else, or what, what, how were your family? Mm, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I was always, uh, I, everyone like in my family come watch me play football um, oh, on the Sundays good. and everything, and yeah. yeah, so I had a lot of support really from my family. Oh, that's really good. Now, um, it hasn't been easy for you though, because at age 16, you discovered that you had epilepsy. Can you talk us through that and what happened? Yeah, it was. Um, I remember like clearly really um I was sixteen years old and I was actually at football training and um I remember heading the ball and then I I must have just just collapsed really. I remember waking up and just sort of seeing everyone around me, around tw twenty players around me and just looking up in the air and I just really didn't know what was going on to be honest. That must have been really scary for you. Very scary because you you know, the first seizure, first seizure I've ever had, and uh, I just didn't know what happened to me really. Mm. And then just remember sort of being cut off into an ambulance and then sort of talking to the, the doctors and yeah. that in the hospital. How so. did that impact your life from then on now that you discovered that you did have epilepsy? How did it, what was going through your mind? How did it affect you? Well, the first thing I thought, well, the first thing that came to my head was really like, am I ever going to be able to play football again? That was the first mm. thing that, that, that jumped into my head. dream, really. right? So. Yeah, definitely, you know. Um, but then talking to the, the neurologist and having regular meetings with him, um, he always said it was, it was fine. Um, I had to really um, kind, kind of get the right dosage of medication at the, at the start and right. try, try and get it controlled. Mm -hmm. And what about how, about how did it affect your family? Like... Um, well, I remember like my mum really. She she had a bit of a tough time of it because at, at the start I I did have quite a few seizures and mm -hmm. um, I remember quite a few times I'd, I'd have some bad ones as well. I remember how going, often would it happen? Well, at the start I reckon a good two a day really. Really? Yeah. Wow. I remember so going to bed one time. I, I was very tired and I remember going to bed one time and then waking up in the in, in, in the uh, in hospital Gosh. in the same night. So if you think about it, you, you, you go into bed and then you mm. wake up in the hospital and you think, well, I'll get here. So yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was very scary. Right. Um, and how do you cope with it with football then? With football, really, um, you know, I've, obviously I've got to let the physios know mm. I, I, I have it. Um, them being uh, fresh professionals at their job and with, with the medical side and everything, they, yeah. they, they would know as well. Um, and the, the football clubs I've been at, they've been supportive. And if, when I have had a, a seizure at, at football, they've always known what to do. So. Well, that's really good. So, I mean, maybe young, youngsters watching that do have the same condition. They're thinking, oh my God, my, my future's over. Not just for football, for any, anything. And it's, they think that, you know, there's no hope for them or they can't realise their dreams, but they can. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proof of that, really. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people 
asked me via um, and Twitter and email mm. um, how they how, how I dealt with it and sort of gave them advice and and little tips and, and info and it has helped them. Okay, now you're ambassador for was it Young People's uh, young, younger young Epilepsy? Yeah. Okay, how did uh, that come about? Um, that actually came about. Um, I was doing a, an interview for a, a newspaper and it came out in the, the next day and then all of a sudden I got loads of phone calls from different uh, epilepsy charities and mm. and then I've done a few bits like uh, radio interviews and uh, a few articles and things mm. like that really and um, then Young, Young Epilepsy actually asked me if I wanted to be like a, a, an ambassador and yeah. I jumped at the chance really and yeah. it was a massive honour. Okay, and how, how have you been helping the youngsters then? Is it sort of telling your story and things like that? Yeah, you know, letting them know my story and how I dealt with it and, like I say, like personal advice and, and tips really. Um, it's, epilepsy is very like complex mm -hmm. and there's so many different types and that with, with, every, with every person who has epilepsy, it's, it's, it's all different to that case. So mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to, to, to pinpoint certain things with, yeah. with, with, with epilepsy and, and, and the case of that person. So. Okay. And what would, you, what would you say to a youngster that's watching now <clears throat> that has epilepsy, that maybe has just been diagnosed and they're really worried about their future, what would you say to them? Um, I'd, I'd say what I'd normally say really, you know, um, when, when I've had people ask me through, through email and things like that, it, 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 it comes down to um, what, what it is that, that can set them off to, to, to have a seizure really. Mm -hmm. So say like, for example, um, I've, I've spoke to someone who has, has a seizure when he plays too much computer games. And because oh, right. okay. the, 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 it's a, a neurological thing mm -hmm. and that can mentally fatigue you if, if you're playing on a computer for so long. Okay. I've advised him, well, if you're playing it for a certain amount of hours, you need to cut that down because otherwise you're in danger of having... listen. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you're in danger. But, yeah. you know, I've, I've been there, I've been a kid, and... It's hard, isn't exactly it? You want to do, yeah. I used to play computer when I was younger, so... Yeah. Um, but, you know, avoiding that, it can definitely help and cut, cut the seizures down, yeah. definitely. But I can imagine a lot of kids look up to you as well, and it's great what you're doing. Yeah, it's nice <laughs> to be, uh, like, an idol to, to, to people who have yeah. epilepsy. And, and, and so there is, you know what, there is good that comes out of some, sometimes, you know, life hits you with blows and you're thinking, you start to think, you know, why me? But you can always find something positive or to help other people with the same thing. So there's always something that you can do with, with certain problems that come your way with certain issues, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's certainly ways around it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with me, um, in, in my case, uh, for, for me to sort of avoid having a seizure, um, I have to have plenty of rest because uh, they found with me, um, I didn't used to get too much sleep. I used to okay. say have five or six hours and mm -hmm. I'll be all right. Um, but that could cause me to have a seizure. And right. so, so you just have to I, the I, trip, I, I, I would, yeah, so, so, so with me, I decided, well, if this is what making me have a seizure, I'll get, get, eight, more hours, sleep. <laughs> get eight hours sleep instead. And well, it's a good reason feel, to get more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if uh, I did feel fatigued, you know, a little power nap or anything like yeah, that, you yeah. know, and whereas I'm, I'm playing a, a very high intense sport, then, mm. you know, I have to sort of kind of be careful there. Yeah, so cool. if I felt tired, like say from training or something, then I'd, you know, take a rest take a and, okay. you know. Okay, and just before you go, Leon, what are your future plans? My future plans, um, I'm hoping to uh, do coaching badge really. Um, uh, I want to sort of get into media as well, so uh, a oh, few brilliant. options really. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you're going to be great, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much for speaking to us. I'm Thank sure you. you've inspired lots of youngsters and people in general. Thank you Thank so you. much. Now, what's really great about this inspirational story was that Leon didn't allow himself to give up on his dream of becoming a professional footballer just because he had epilepsy. And I think it's this kind of attitude that really differentiates successful people to the rest. No matter what life throws at you, you will do anything to achieve your goal. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed looking back at these stories with me. And I think the final thing that I have to say is that if we let our circumstances define us, we will never achieve our dreams. So don't let anything take away your dream. 
If you have a story to tell us, don't forget you can contact us via the website chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet at chrissybshow and visit our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Till next time, bye-bye for now.